Hello, this is Mr Field and this is my video on bonding models including metallic bonding. Now before you start this make sure you're confident with covalent bonding, with covalent structures and with ionic bonding and I've got videos on all of those if you need to revisit that. So in this video we will be looking at um, a general recap of each of the types of bonding. We're going to look at metallic bonding which is the new type we haven't met before. We'll look at interpreting experimental data and the limitations of our models of bonding. So before we go any further, let's recap what we already know about um, bonding. Our first kind is ionic bonding. Now in ionic bonding, we have the ionic bond is the attraction between opposite ions. I should say that is the electrostatic attraction. That's the force between those opposite ions. And that gives us this structure here, which we call an ionic lattice. This is a repeating 3D pattern of you know, negative, positive, negative, positive ions in three dimensions. And there are these really strong forces between the ions holding each one in place. And that means that ionic substances have a really high melting point because it takes a lot of energy to break those strong electrostatic forces. We also find that when they're solid, these things don't conduct electricity because the ions can't move. However, if we melt them by heating them, or dissolve them into a solution, then they do conduct electricity because the ions are now free to move. Our other kind of bonding that we've met before was covalent bonding. Now covalent bonding involves shared pairs of electrons and we can draw it something like this. So here we can see with hydrogen and chlorine, their outer shells are overlapping and in that overlap, there is a dot and cross to represent a shared electron pair and that is our covalent bond. Now, there are two types of covalent structure. Some of them are simple molecular. For example, we've got water here made up of these individual molecules made of three atoms. Now, these have low melting points because they're held together by just these weak intermolecular forces. And those are really easy to break. It doesn't take much energy. And so they have low melting points because of that. However, some covalent uh, substances are what we call giant covalent that gives them a very high melting point because in the giant covalent structure, we have this repeating pattern of millions of atoms in every direction joined by these strong covalent bonds. So this pattern just goes on and on and on in every direction. Now, neither the giant covalent nor the simple molecular substances conduct electricity because there are no electrons free to move. The one exception is graphite, um, which is one of our allotropes of carbon. That does conduct, but in general, covalent substances do not. Now, metallic bonding, this is the third kind of bonding that we haven't met yet. Now, to understand metallic bonding, it's worth, first of all, to think about the actual structure of metals in the first place. Now, let's imagine we were looking at potassium, um, which has the uh, symbol K. Now, potassium's got one electron in its outer shell. Um, and so you might imagine a lattice of potassium ions would look like this, you know, or potassium atoms would look like this. We've got all of the potassium atoms nicely arranged in neat rows with their one electron in the outer shell. However, in metallic bonding, the outer shell electrons become delocalized. That means they are free to move. And that means we have something like this. So each atom loses its outer shell. So if you look closely, you can see those are now K plus ions rather than um, whole potassium atoms. And the electrons are just all over the place. And importantly, those electrons are free to move. So we describe this as a lattice of metal cations surrounded by a cloud of delocalized electrons. And the metallic bond itself, metallic bonding, is the attraction between that lattice of metal ions and the cloud of delocalized electrons. Now, this gives um, metals in general high melting points, not always as high as ionic compounds, but still pretty high. And that's because there is a strong attraction between the metal cations and the delocalized electron cloud. Um, these things also always conduct electricity. And the reason why is because the electrons are free to move. So if I uh, attach a potential difference with positive at one end and negative at the other, all those electrons that were just kind of roaming around everywhere now move in the same direction and they drift towards that positive charge. Um, it's worth saying also that metals in group two, because they've got two electrons uh, in their outer shells, 
have more electrons to delocalize, they end up with more electrons in their electron clouds, so they have stronger bonding and higher melting points, and they're also better conductors. So a really common kind of question that students always find hard is to use um, a data table like this containing, say, melting point data and electrical conductivity to determine the structure and bonding of um, a set of substances. Now, to answer this, we need to think, first of all, about what are the properties of each type of structure. So our first structure was simple molecular. Okay? Now, these have low melting points because melting them only requires you to break weak intermolecular forces, and they never conduct because they've got no electrons that are free to move. The next structure was our giant covalent. Okay? Now these, our giant covalent, these have a high melting point because melting requires you to break strong covalent bonds. And again, they never conduct, except for graphite, they never conduct because they've got no electrons that are free to move. Next, we've got ionic structures. So ionic um, substances, these again have a high melting point because melting them requires you to break the strong electrostatic forces between the oppositely charged ions. And with these ones, their conductivity varies. So as a solid, they don't conduct because the ions can't move. But as a liquid, so that means molten or dissolved, they do conduct because the ions can move. And then finally, we've got the ones we saw on the previous slide, which was the uh, metallic bonding. Now, in metallic bonding, we've got a high melting point because melting requires you to uh, break the strong forces between the electron cloud and the lattice of ions, and they always conduct because those electrons are always free to move. Okay, uh, always uh, conduct. So, with that in mind, now we can start to interpret our data. So, if we look at A, now A never conducts. So that tells us it's either it's going to be one of our two covalent ones, simple molecular or giant covalent. But we've got that low melting point. Now, only the simple molecular has that really low melting point. So that tells you that A is simple molecular because of the combination of never conducting and those low melting points. So what about B? Now, B has got this really high melting point there. So that tells you it's going to be one of these three with a star next to it. They've all got high melting points. But the key thing is the conductivity. It's low when it's a solid and high when it's a liquid. So that means it must be ionic. And in fact, that's what we find. B is ionic with that high melting point and that change in conductivity. So what about C? Now C, again, it's got high melting points. So it's one of our starred ones. But this time, the conductivity is always low, both as a solid and as a liquid. So that must make it giant covalent. Um, because of that high melting point and never conducting. And so D, obviously, you can kind of guess is going to be metallic because that's the only one left. But let's let's try and prove it ourselves. Now, the key thing with D is that it always conducts electricity, both as a solid and as a liquid. And the only one that always conducts is our metallic bonding. So that's the kind of approach you should take to interpreting this data. Think about what the conductivity and what the melting point tell you about what type of structure that you've got present. Now, the last thing to think about um, in this video is the limitations of our bonding models. Now, the way what we mean by bonding models is the diagrams we draw. Now, we draw diagrams in two dimensions like this. So there's a two dimensional flat diagram. But actually, that's not particularly accurate because really molecules are actually three dimensional particles like that. But it's harder to draw those. So we tend to keep it simple by drawing them 2D. So just bear in mind they are really 3D. Another limitation is that we tend to draw molecules uh, in, we tend to draw our diagrams of molecules in this ball and stick format like that, um, where the ball is the atom and the sticks between them represent the bonds. But actually, that's not what they look like at all. Really, the atoms actually merge together like this and the atoms are actually touching. But it's much harder to understand um, pictures drawn like that. So we keep them as ball and stick models to make it look a little bit clearer. And the last thing to say is that the dot and cross diagrams make electrons appear different. So if we look here, um, we've got crosses for the electrons from one fluorine and dots for the electron from the other. But actually, the electrons are completely identical, even though they look the same in that diagram. So this doesn't matter. You know, um, It's OK that we make these compromises when we draw our models because we're trying to represent different kinds of things. But it's just worth bearing in mind that doesn't represent the true reality. So that's it. That's the end of this video. Well done, as always, if you got to the end.